if any lives matter, you're going to have to have major radical democracy. But can you have radical democracy in America without empire, without white supremacy, without male supremacy, without transphobia, without homophobia, without losing sight of the humanity of Muslims and Jews and Arabs? That's an unanswered question. We just don't know. And let's just be honest about it. There's nothing wrong with wrestling with despair the way Jacob wrestled with despair in the 32nd chapter of Genesis. But we can come up with a new name. God wrestlers with deep wounds, with deep hurts, with new energies. That's where we are now, right on the edge of the cliff with the neo-fascist gangster in the White House and the milk toast neoliberals who still vote for his military budget over and over again, AFRICOM expands in Africa. The same ugly policies in Latin America. We've talked about the Middle East. We don't have time to talk about Asia, but that's very important too with China and all of their forms of domination. What a time to be alive, pandemic and all. And yet, here comes the People's Party. Well, here comes that same radical democratic tradition that embraces us all. And I come in from the chocolate side of the empire and say, I'm bringing Curtis Mayfield with me. I'm going to bring Sam Cooke with me and Nina Simone with me. Why? Because they provide a structure of feeling and value that provides a ground for a prophetic fight back in the face of this empire collapsing and in the face of the possible regeneration and reawakening of it. Last but not least, at this particular moment, I've got brothers and sisters on both sides. When I listen to Noam Chomsky and Angela Davis and even my dear brother Bob O'Vakin and, and brother Carl Dix and others, they say, oh, we agree with the, the critique of the empire, but we cast a vote for Biden. Say, ooh, I'm not used to voting for milk toast folk like that. The anti fascist folk, okay, I do understand. But I hear my dear brothers and sisters on the other side Chris Hedges, and Glenn Ford, and Paul Street, and Margaret Kimberly, Juma Baraka. I love those folk too. I learned so much from them. They're all comrades. They say, you can't vote for a neoliberal, you can't vote for the same Biden. You bring such critique to bear. You got to go for Green, go for Brother Howie, go for Sister Angela. That debate is a real one. And it's, it, it ought to go on. And at the moment, I'm leaning with Angela. I'm leaning with Marianne. I'm leaning with Noam Chomsky. But it's not that it makes me that much better. I just believe as part of an anti-fascist coalition, Trump's fascism is one that calls into question the very possibility for any rights and liberties so that all of us could be gone. That's kind of basis that he has. What is it, one out of four of the folks who support him want to shut down the media. That's the kind of fascist sensibilities. This is Sinclair Lewis, it can't happen here, taking place slowly in real time before our eyes. This is the kind of moment we live in. This is why this movement for People's Party is so fundamentally crucial. And we will resist the same self-righteousness that we get among the neoliberals. We are stepping into the unknown, so what? I come from a people that step on, step out on nothing and still land on something that we ate, that we helped create based on a love of truth and a love of goodness and a love of beauty. We keep beauty in there. Beauty is very important for empowerment. So I want to bring this to a close. I want to thank you, Brother Nick. It comes down to whether the Democratic Party is a reformable organization, number one, or whether it's even at its core democratic, and it's neither. And, and this has just been a misread on the part of progressives. But of course, that misread is perpetrated uh, by the Democratic Party establishment, uh, You know whether they allow Kucinich to run or uh, Bernie or anyone else. Uh, the idea is to uh, give expression to uh, those kinds of issues. But then in the end, once the presidential nominee is selected or anointed, as Biden was, to corral uh, the progressive wing of the Democratic Party or progressives back into the Democratic Party fold. And of course, it works every time because as the political situation devolves, the monstrosities that are coughed up, uh, you know, whether it's Bush or 
Trump uh, become worse and worse. And believe me, this next time around is going to be much worse than Trump. Um, so uh, it, it's diminishing returns. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, these, these figures are careerists in the end. They, they AOC and Bernie and all the rest of them. Um, they're not temperamentally or morally fit to lead this fight, uh, which is a fight against the ruling elites, which includes the Democratic Party establishment itself. Um, and uh, that is not going to come from within. Welcome, welcome once again to the Radical Imagination. I'm your host, Jim Vredos. I'm a sociologist who's taught at John Jay College of Criminal Justice and Yeshiva University here in New York City. The Movement for a People's Party burst onto the American political scene in 2017 as an exploratory organization aimed at creating a new progressive populist political party. 61% of the United States wanted a competitive third party. Support of the Democratic and Republican parties was at an all-time low. The movement began a challenge to the two-party corporate duopoly who weren't serving democracy are governing in the people's interest. As movement endorser Cornel West put it, can we have a radical democracy party in America without empire, without white supremacy, without male supremacy, without transphobia or homophobia, without losing sight of the humanity of Jews, Muslims, and Arabs, a radical democracy caring for the humanity of us all. Out of the struggles can come new energies. The People's Party can become part of that energy. Noam Chomsky, as usual, sums it up succinctly. In the United States, there is basically one party, the Business Party. It has two factions, called Democrats and Republicans, which are somewhat different, but carry out variations of the same policies. By and large, I'm opposed to those policies, as is most of the population. On today's Radical Imagination, we'll take a closer look at the new People's Party for the people, not the billionaires. It already has more than 150,000 members across 50 states and is officially registered in California, Colorado, Maine, Ohio, and Oregon, and working with ballot access experts on a 50-state party formation. The party is opening nominations for its first generation of candidates. In collaboration with state chapters, it will be supporting nominees at every level of government, including Congress in the 2022 midterm elections, the Senate, and hopefully the presidency in 2024. On the show today, we have two prominent leaders in the movement. Mike McCorkle is an attorney former chair of the Progressive Democrats of Colorado, a two-time national Bernie delegate, and a progressive political activist. He's also the general counsel for the party. And Nick Brana, the founder and national coordinator of the movement for the People's Party, is also with us. He was the electoral manager of our revolution and was the national political outreach coordinator for Bernie in 2016. So welcome, Michael and Nick, to the new People's Party. Uh, come a long way, and it's just a thrill and an honor to to have you guys on. Um, I, I know I was was with you, Nick, at more or less the beginning of this, and I'm so glad to see how it's progressing. So let's start with you, Nick. Tell us a little bit about the history of this movement why you feel it was so necessary, and a little bit of, of the history of third-party movements, if you will. And yeah. the, the, the rarity of a realignment of parties in American history. Yes, those moments come about. Uh, historians separate um, US party history into about six eras, uh, and we are right about at the moment, um, and, and they figured that the period of time, the length of time between those eras is about the same amount, it's about 32 years, and that the last one was in about 1980, and so that we are way overdue for a political party realignment. Um, and we think that this is it, in fact. I mean, with all of the converging crises 
um, with uh, the Democratic Party proving unreformable, blocking Bernie Sanders a second time, with the Democrats and the Republicans responding to coronavirus with the biggest transfer of wealth in American history to, to the, from the poorest to the richest at the time when the poorest needed it most, 50 million unemployment claims, 50 million people losing their employer base, health care, more than a third of small businesses destroyed in the United States. That's what we're facing. That's the legacy of these two corporate parties. So the movement for a people's party was born in that context, because even though things are more dire now than they have been in decades and generations, really, going back to the Great Depression, uh, this has still been a building crisis of neoliberalism, shifting both party establishments to the far right and thrusting people into this kind of laissez-faire hell in the United States, uh, where working people have none of the power and both of the parties are corporate funded. And so the Movement for a People's Party was born. Um, I myself worked in, uh, uh, on, on Democratic campaigns uh, with John Kerry um, and also with Barack Obama uh, and with Terry McAuliffe before that, some establishment figures. That turned me off very much to the establishment of the Democratic Party. In 2015, I joined the Bernie campaign became the National Political Outreach Coordinator, where I lobbied the DNC members for support for Bernie Sanders. And that was really the last straw to me, to see how many of them I, that we were supposed to convince, in fact, these elite superdelegates who are just DNC members, many of them uh, corporate uh, consultants or lobbyists to support Bernie. And so that was the last straw for me. Of course, that wasn't going to happen. And so I got together with some Bernie staff and delegates and volunteers. We formed Draft Bernie for a People's Party in 2017. It became the Movement for a People's Party. And last year in 2020, it more than tripled its membership, growing to, as you said, 150,000 members in every state across the country and building off of the momentum of a record two out of every three Americans, 62%, wanting a major new party. It's an all-time high. And the number of independents for the first time in the United States breaking 50%. Um, and so that's where we are today. We are now establishing state parties across the state. We're working towards ballot access in those states. And we are working to build a major alternative, run candidates, as you said, in the midterms and a presidential contest in 2024, because the moment demands nothing less. And we have to provide an escape hatch to authoritarian right-wing populism, the kind that Trump represents, the kind that Obama gave us as his legacy of Trump after failing to keep all of his progressive promises. We have to provide an escape hatch from the establishment that is not towards the authoritarian right. And that's what the People's Party represents. We're going to guarantee food, housing, health care, a good education, a secure retirement, peace, justice, to all. Just to go back just, just a little bit to, to what you were saying before, there was that, in a sense, that final attempt, right, to draft Bernie. And as I was talking with Mike before the show, uh, I was there at that that effort, and uh, uh, you were going to give him, uh, was it 50,000 signatures petitioning? And, and his office wasn't even open. You couldn't even give it to him. And and so tell me, why do you think he was so reluctant to do that? And also, uh, hearing everything you said, we do have a neoliberal president who won the election by 7 million people, uh, 7 million votes. So um, uh, what gives you confidence that you can overcome those sorts of uh, uh, statistics? You know, I agree with Dr. West, who it was, uh, uh, it was Dr. West um, who got together with me. We went on Democracy Now! Um, in March uh, of 2017. We issued an invitation to a town hall to Bernie. And we said, Bernie, the majority of this country wants a major new party already. It wasn't as high as it is today, but it was still a majority. And we invited him to a conference that we held at American University in September. We presented him with 50,000 signatures. We delivered it to his office. Uh, unfortunately, 
uh, Bernie wanted to uh, run for president again as a Democrat. And we see how that turned out. And Cornell said that uh, Bernie missed this historical moment. And he's right. That was the moment to, to consolidate the 13 million people who had voted for him in the primary, who had been so enthusiastic for a progressive populist alternative into a major new party. And in fact, if he had done that, there would be today a major new people's party. And I believe that Bernie Sanders would have won that election running as our candidate against Donald Trump and Joe Biden, two of mm -hmm. the most disliked uh, candidates um, in, in the country. Yeah, that, that's a really interesting point because we'll never ever know for sure. But I, I get your point. I think there's a lot of validity in what you're saying. Mike, you're doing the nuts and bolts here, keeping this thing going and expanding it. And uh, as the, the legal counsel, tell us a little about your work and your efforts. Oh, I was afraid you would do that, Jim. Like at first we hear from Cornell and then we hear from Noam Chomsky and then Nick gets me all fired up. And then you're like, Mike, yeah, tell you. us the boring parts. I, I'm, no, like, this, I'm here this, for that. You're absolutely crucial. This is, you're going to make it uh, happen. Well, we're, we're going to make it happen. It's going to take all of us, every single one of us right. and as many more of us as we can get. Uh, it is uh, for all the talk, even out of Democrats these days, about you know the the, the sacred right to vote. Uh, while while they're happy to give you the option to vote at the curbside, they're not happy to give you an option to vote for anything outside of that two-headed business party that Nick mentioned, and that uh, that Noam Chomsky I think described as well. Um, so what we find is just even on the state level. We have plus puzzles to solve. In some states, it's very easy. In Vermont, um, if if you wear matching T-shirts, I think you can form a political party there. Uh, it may be a little more difficult, but it's not much more difficult. It's very easy in Vermont. In places like Ohio, New Jersey, Missouri, it's very very difficult. And uh, and then uh, again at the federal level for the FEC and on things. It's a, a whole other level of complexity. Uh, the F FEC and the IRS don't use the same definitions for anything. So um, it, it's a little bit as though it's confusing on purpose. And I think that historically it has posed obstacles to groups that are trying to do what we're doing. But we're not afraid. We're going to get through them. Mm -hmm. Do you foresee other groups, other parties coming on in? Uh, Green Party, various right-wing parties. You foresee, perhaps, perhaps we're jumping the gun here, uh, but uh, we're looking at the Israeli election with uh, eight very disparate factions trying to uh, form a government here. But, but seriously, do you see this also leading to other groups and other parties uh, uh, trying to organize themselves and, and become influential in the political process. And um, also, what about especially the other progressive people and groups? Um, as I understand, you want to try to work with as many people as possible in, in, in coalition, sort of a fusion politics, if I can use the term that uh, Reverend Barber uses for the Poor People's Campaign. Is that correct? Yes. It is. Yeah, I think so. And if, if anything, the experience, oh, I, I'm sorry, did you want to jump in on that one, Nick? I, I, no, on, go on the for ballot it, Mike. I'll go stuff, after I, you. I, okay, I'll leave you all the good stuff. I'll handle the boring part. Like, you know, you know, I do the boring part and then you jump in. So I, uh, on the ballot access, because of the challenges that we face and the unfairness of that difficulty, I mean, because I, I could form a corporation right now while we're on this call in Colorado. I could go online and form a corporation. And five minutes later, I could go online in New York and probably take my corporation to New York and I'd be up and running, legal and valid. Mm. We can do that for for-profit companies, but, but not for political parties, not for our First Amendment political rights. That upsets me now more that I've had to deal with it. So I, I have become a supporter of multi-partisanship. And uh, and hope that we will help along any of our fellow travelers on the road to giving people in America more options. Hit you it, want to answer? 
Next, do you want to answer that? Ab- absolutely. I think that we're in a moment right now where you know people their loyalty to a particular brand or party. Um, which has been assumed for so long as being kind of like unassailable and so deeply rooted. Like, you know, you hear about people describing, you know, themselves as like multi-generational Republicans or Democrats. I don't believe that's true. In my experience, in my four years of organizing, and in fact, before that, and speaking to people, that's not true. What is true is that people want basic human needs. And they're not getting them from these two parties. And it's not getting better. It's getting worse. Even though the country gets richer as a whole and has gotten richer for decades, ever since for the last about 50 years, since 1970, you saw it with the minimum wage. It broke with productivity. It broke with corporate profits, with executive pay. And it flatlined for working people while the executive pay, the corporate pay just blew up and the corporate tax rates, the individual tax rates collapsed. And so there, people are more concerned with being able to provide for themselves and their families and give their kids a better future than they had. Because if there's anything that was the essence of the American dream, that was it. That if you worked hard, you could succeed and your family could do better. Your kids could do better. That this was a land of opportunity. And that contract with the people of this country has been broken. And that's what we're here to fix. We're not here, not just here to fix it, but we're here to raise it. And we're here to say that all basic needs are in fact now human rights. And this is not radical. This happens in Europe. It used to happen even to a greater extent in our country, in Latin America, across the world. Agreed. Agreed. So, so as you point out, it's, it's a very fluid period in time. So all kinds of possibilities are, are, are there. Um, but I don't have to tell either one of you uh, that progressives, the left, famously have, uh, you know, gone around um, shooting each other in the foot and have caused all sorts of trouble uh, with each other. And, and so people, will, again, say, well, look, you're, you're Nick, Mike, you're being spoilers here. What we need, this is not socialism. This is not what we really need. Uh, how do you meet these, those sorts of criticisms and challenges? The, the left has a notorious uh, history of uh, being of, of factionalizing and cannibalizing itself. And yeah. part of the reason for that is that the left in the United States has evolved in a way that is uh, that really has no parallel. Um, following the Second World War, um, we saw it immediately after uh, after Roosevelt's term, um, in fact, before then, uh, there was a reaction, a counter reaction, a counter revolution to the New Deal um, that involved uh, Taft Hartley taking away labor rights, decreasing unions down from about third of unionization, about 35 percent down to about 10 percent. Now, that's that's been the history of backlash of these two parties. And to answer something that you brought up uh, a little earlier, Jim, uh, something that really validates exactly what we're doing and the deep need for it is that we now have for a long time there were not there there weren't enough progressives in congress the national legislature to do something about this crisis to actually exert a kind of effectual leverage to get something done and now because the democrats despite trump's horrific failure in handling the pandemic which the democrats share blame in despite uh the uh, second Great Depression that we were in the midst. The Democrats barely edged out a victory in the House by only a few seats. In the Senate, the barest of majorities, 50-50, and the presidency by about tens of thousands of votes in a handful of swing states. And so given that, that dynamic, though, has actually result has meant that the progressives have enough votes to deny the Democrats the speakership, for example, as we saw with the force the vote push, which we participated in, and must pass legislation. But time and time again, unfortunately, we see that the dynamics in the Democratic Party prevent the progressives in the party who could now demand, they could demand a floor vote on Medicare for all. They could demand a $15 minimum wage. They could be demanding Medicare for all. And we, we, we're we not seeing that 
because the dynamics in the Democratic Party are unfortunately moderate progressives there. And that's why we need a party that is free of corporate money so that the politicians in that party, the elected representatives, don't answer to anyone, even in party leadership, who takes corporate money. Rather, everybody gets their power from the people. Under, understood. But let's also add that another variable here, what's going on the dynamics in the Republican Party. And as you again well know, uh, there's been, as you point out, backlash uh, for decades, right wing backlash. But I've never seen it this fervent and, and this volatile. And so you're dealing with a, with a neo-fascist violent uh, element here that, uh, boy, uh, we, we really haven't seen in this country, at least in, in, the, in, in, the, near few, in the near past. So how, how does that figure into all of this? Because this is, um, a lot of people are saying this is going to get worse uh, in, in the presidential election. We're going to get somebody who's more competent, not so self-destructive as Trump. So what do you say to that challenge? I say that every reason that we were told to vote for the lesser of the two evils we were told vote for the lesser of two evils because uh, you won't get the trade deals that are destroying your jobs, uh, because you won't be crushed by medical debt. You won't, your loved ones won't die in hospitals right next to the medication that could save their life because they couldn't afford it. You, because you will be able to live in a country that can provide jobs to everyone. We'll tackle the climate crisis. You'll get a living wage. All of the reasons that you were told to vote for the lesser of two evils to avoid what the Republicans would do has been done by voting for the lesser of two evils. And it is, in fact, that logic that has brought us to the point where we are today, where we have an increasingly rapid descent into authoritarian oligarchy in this country. And we have to analyze, we have to think about this, not just in individual election cycles, whether it's uh, uh, Trump versus Hillary Clinton or Trump versus Biden. We have to think about this across multiple election cycles. What is the long-term trend? And it is actually that thinking of remaining in the two corporate party system that is creating that descent into mm. authoritarian oligarchy. That's the pattern that we have to break. We have to offer people an alternative because as much as we may not like it, it is the Republican Party is now the populist party in this country. And the Democratic Party is the party of coastal elites. And that means that the worse that things get, the more frustrated the people get with the political situation in this country, people will drift increasingly towards the worst form of antidote towards what exists, a worse version of it, an accelerated version of it, which is the kind of nationalistic fascism that Trump begins to represent. And Trump was a buffoon. He was a reality TV billionaire. But the next one, the next one, as Bernie and AOC have said, when Joe Biden fails, we are going to get a competent fascist. We're going to get an ideological fascist. And it's not even just Bernie and AOC saying that anymore. Steve Schmidt, of all people, came out and said that. Yeah, well, we're, um, boy, we're, we're, the odds here are, are, we're just really going to have to roll the dice here. I think you're right in your analysis. Uh, Mike, as you interact with, with different chapters and different state organizations uh, around the country, are you finding that too? You mentioned the complexity uh, of Ohio and, and uh, of, um, uh, was it, was it uh, not Colorado, but um, Florida perhaps. Um, is that what you're finding also resistance or is there more accommodation to the sort of thinking that that Nick is is uh, is, is talking about here? Um, from the authorities, ele election authorities around the country have been very friendly. They, if nothing else, I, I think the novelty of what we're trying to do is exciting to some of them. Like that. I've had some of them tell me, oh, I've never had a chance to do this kind of petition before. Um, that kind of thing. Um, we haven't really run into any official opposition yet. We may not have really scared our opponents just yet. But uh, I, I think that 
in both of the sort of parties of the past, you've got kind of captive factions that uh, like the never Trumpers in the Republican Party, but what are they going to do? They've only got so many choices. And that's how it was for several years for me as a progressive in the Democratic Party, that what option have we got? And that's why I think that what we're doing is important as a way to try to clear a way forward. And for that matter, I, I've agreed to sit down with some never Trump or Coloradans here and talk to them about what I know about starting a party. I'd be happy to have them split the vote on that side of things as well and free that captive faction from the neo-fascist party as well. It, it is, I think, another illustration of how benefited we would be as a country but by making it easier for us to have many small parties that are forced to work together in coalition and, and to practice the skill of getting along in coalition and governing. Michael, I, I'd love if you could just expand on that a little bit, uh, your, your interaction with the Never Trumpers and, and the conversations that you're having. I think this is so profoundly important, crucial. Who can you reach? Who is still reachable in a sense? Uh, I'm very sympathetic to uh, those old school conservatives who really did believe in a form of limited government that wasn't limited as today's is to just protecting the rich from the poor and never the, the other way around. Um, and so there, there's a fellow out here who he and I worked together at a tax place, you know, and used to uh, hang out and argue all the time. But it was good arguments. You know, we, we differed politically, but we were uh, we were opponents. We were not enemies. And and I, for one, miss that. So I, I've been back in touch with them since. I, I had seen some of these folks very bravely, I think, taking a stand against the uh, Trump fascist faction that has taken over their party. And uh, I still, I disagree, but I respect what they're trying to do. And I feel like there's enough common ground there that I'm happy to at least share with them what I can and try to create, create options for the, that community as well as my own. So it sounds like with the sort of reasonable, rational policies and programs you are putting forth, a certain percentage of those Trumpites will also be attractive. As well as you point out, Nick, uh, perhaps vast segments of the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. That's the hope, right? Uh, and independence, certainly. The platform that we are building on is a majoritarian platform. And so to give you an idea, you, there are 60% of Americans who support housing for all, 65% yeah. who support a basic income, 69% who support legalizing marijuana, 72% who support Medicare for all, 73% who support increasing financial regulation, ending the wars, 74%. Ending mandatory minimum sentencing, 77%. Federal jobs guarantee, free public college, net neutrality, universal pre-K, getting big money out of politics, a Green New Deal. All of these are 60%, 70%, 80%, 90% issues that find no expression from the two corporate parties. And that's the majoritarian platform that we're running on. Nick, let me just say, what about uh, criminal justice defunding the police, ending mass incarceration, abolition of prisons. What what about that? What are you finding? What's the data on that? And there is also large support for uh, ending man mandatory minimums. As I mentioned, that's a big reform. Likewise, um, for uh, for abolishing private prisons. And that's also something that we support. Right. And defunding of police. I think it was better explained and understood i i think uh, again a majority would understand why we need that as well let me i'm not trying to throw a fly in the ointment here too but uh what's your what's your platform on for example uh the middle east palestine and israel what are you saying there and and how these sorts of hot button issues often polarize people uh as you i don't have to tell you so what are you saying about that very complicated, intractable um, conflict. They do. And we support the complete end of American weapon sales uh, to Israel, um, and not just Israel, but 
arms deal with the United States should not be arms dealing around the world in particular when there are millions of people in this country that cannot afford basic needs and we're sending about we're sending hundreds of millions billions of dollars annually about three billion dollars um, to Israel that's something that we believe needs to end we believe that there needs to be a two-state solution we believe that the settlements need to be halted um, and we were very much uh, against the recent incursion in Gaza uh, that happened. So these those yeah. issues can be more polarizing and they have to be navigated, you know, and there are principles, of course, that we have to adhere to, while at the same time recognizing that the things that unite us are those economic populist issues. Every single one of us, you know, no matter what, skin color or gender or national background you are needs health care needs food needs a roof over their head i i understand what you're saying i think I've, i appreciate your your response because i think again some of these very provocative issues uh are often uh talked about in in maximalist ways that is you present the one side or the other in a very maximal way and and you're Polarizing the other side, I think the Women's March a few years ago uh, was an example of that. So that, that sort of stuff needs to really be uh, worked on. And, and, and we don't need to polarize our own people uh, in, 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 in this way. And um, I'm, glad to, I'm glad for your response on that. Um, tell us a little more. So the, the platform itself, you are going to have a formalized platform or in, in at the end of this year is that correct or a convention that will pre present it is that correct absolutely correct uh we are going to be voting on a final set of uh national rules charter bylaws ratifying that um at a national convention likewise with a final platform we'll be doing work uh ahead of the final uh, of the convention on both of those, of course, but yes, um, those are both going to be created uh, by our membership and approved by our membership. And we have what we have now is an interim platform, uh, very heavily inspired by Bernie Sanders' uh, uh, platform. I see, I see. And when is this going to take place in in the fall? We're hoping in the fall. Yes, in the, in fall, the fall of this year. So, Mike, have you cleared your desk? Um, what is this? We're in June, July, August, September. It sounds like you're going to be very busy. Nick is going to send you a lot of gonna be. papers. Yeah, you are busy already. But gonna, even gonna, more gonna be. Yeah. 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 We, we've been we've been hard at work on this. It is an extraordinarily complex challenge that we're working on to set up not just state parties all over the country, but also to set up a national party. It's not something that's happened at all very often in history. And I, I don't believe it's ever been tried on the scale and at the pace that we're trying it this year. Really? And um, and for, for me, what, what is exciting is that we are working hard right now to create these structures where our members can come together and have the discussions about what exactly we stand for and uh, and what it means to be part of the People's Party. And I think that some of those factional dif differences that are, are so so common among progressives, uh, they feel existential when they happen outside the framework of a party. Oh, I think uh, once we've got a space, we can come together and deliberate on these things and vote and, and come to an understanding as a party. I, I think that's going to help a, a great deal. Um, the, the FEC part is very complicated. It, it gets to be where... Um, yeah, any political party in its most basic sense is a system of nested committees from the county or city level all the way up to a national committee. And those committees nominate people for public office and they fill vacancies in nominations at its bare bones. That's what a, a political party is. But each level of that committee for campaign finance purposes will have to have its own thing going on. In, in, in not too technical terms, and and a degree of independence within the apparatus, where we will be increasingly setting up state party machines, including in New York and uh, New Jersey very soon. Massachusetts is already up and up and going, 
uh, where, where people can come together and they'll have their own state party. And we have to trust to the common sense and the common cause that we're all going to be going the same direction there. It's going to be an act of collective faith in a way. Um, that's not what the F and FEC stands for, though. It's not faith. It might be friendly. They're, they're a nice bunch, but it's wicked complicated. But we're uh, sorting through what we can do so that we can do it legally and above board. We know, um, I think Nick can vouch for this from his campaign experience, that uh, we're going to get grief even if we do everything exactly right. We're going to get complaints. So we owe it to our community to do the very best job we can putting this together carefully, watertight. So, as you say, this has never really been, this has never happened before. Is that what I heard you say in, in, to this extent in, in American history or certainly not, in recent history? Not all at once uh, with a bunch of state parties coming into existence all at once and a national party coming in right on the footsteps of that. Um, the Greens, to their credit, put together a national party committee uh, about 20 some years ago in the Ralph Nader era. Um, the Ross Perot people did it briefly in the 90s as well. But this is going to be the first time that it's been tried um, and not just being tried, it's already working. We're seeing this from, from one Portland in Maine to the other Portland in Oregon. We got people joining the People's Party. So we're doing it at a rate that hasn't been tried before. And um, yeah, it's uh, it's certainly a challenge, but I, I think we're getting there. Yeah. Good for you. you. You know, Nick, I think we we talked at one point saying, again, this moment in history, and, and my own feeling is that we this possibly could have happened in 68, 1968, right after Bobby Kennedy was assassinated. I think there was an opportunity to do something like what you're trying to do at that point. Uh, and uh, that's not 32 years ago, but um, what do you think about that? What do you think about those, those past possibilities? And again, this does seem like the right time to try this again, correct? We are way overdue for this. Uh, as uh, progressive populists, we like to cite what it is that the majority of Americans uh, want as far as issues because the American people are with us on the issues. But you know what? The American people are going beyond that. They are saying how they want it done. They're not just telling us what they want done policy-wise. They're saying, here's how I want it achieved. We want a major new party by about a two thirds majority. We quote, believe that the Democratic and Republican parties are doing such a poor job that a major new party is needed. And that's the mandate that we're working off. Record number of people voting in the past election. Again, well, voting was more accessible. Right? So I'm sorry, go ahead. That's true. Well, voting was more accessible than ever before. There was, uh, uh, it was made more accessible as a result of coronavirus. And also, yes, people are getting more politically engaged. That is, that is a, a good thing uh, because they're seeing that to some extent that you know this, this does have consequences. Now they're still trapped either voting for the left or the right of, of, the, of the billionaire party. Um, and so that, keeps them contained. But as Chris Hedges has said, um, uh, we had him on the podcast, uh, the People's Podcast, uh, which we've started. And he said that the, uh, that the left really should have broken with uh, the Democrats uh, when Bill Clinton uh, took up NAFTA and, uh, from George W. Bush and, and it took a Democrat to finish it. And of course, a Democrat to um, to obliterate the, the New Deal, as Bill Clinton did. And he said that that was a monumental betrayal of the working class on the part of the left, and I completely agree with him. But today, we are armed with a level of urgency that has never occurred, particularly because of the climate crisis that has never existed, and the global scale of problems today that has never existed, at the same time that we are armed with tools that we have never had before. 
Uh, and that, in particular, the internet, which powered the Bernie Sanders campaign for a crowdsource funding ra raising model, crowdsource organizing model. And that's made possible, that campaign. And it's likewise making possible new parties around the world, particularly in Europe and Latin America. New parties, especially on the left, replacing center left parties. And we believe that the U.S. shouldn't be left out from that. We need to do exactly the same. That's a, that's a great point. Uh that you're making, the international aspect of all this. And I know, particularly we've talked about this, Nick, um, you, you really see yourself as an internationalist. Uh, so this just can't happen um, in localized areas. It, 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 it needs to be global. It I does. mean, at least at, 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 it is a can't do everything all at once, but, but that is really what ultimately needs to happen as well. It is a global throwing off of a neoliberal regime that has captured the world, a neoliberal capitalist regime. Um, and it was brought to a head by the pandemic that exposed that in fact, this kind of regime is incapable of prioritizing human needs. And even, even when you exacerbate the conditions around the world, um, to the point of a deadly pandemic that forces uh, lockdowns, that forces uh, um, closures of, of, of businesses and people having to leave their jobs. And it cannot even take care of people in that level of crisis. And that, that the governments that are corrupted by that kind of economic system and by the corporations that are the only ones who profit off of that system, the corporations and the billionaires, they cannot have, in fact respond to that. And so there's a level of dysfunction, paralysis, separation from the interests of, for, of people's interests, of people's well-being in this system that is not just unique to the United States. It's particular to the United States and it's exported by the United States with its wars, with its neoliberalism, with its economic domination of other countries. But it is global and it is something that we as the People's Party believe in addressing. Right. And it's falling all over uh, itself to bring uh, bring us back to so-called normalcy, as they put it, or <clears throat> as Jeff Be Bezos would want uh, to get on his spaceship and go wherever the hell he's going to be going now. Uh, did, did you read you read the, uh, the with his brother too? But um, did, you read the headlines today, right? In the Times, we've known this for years. The the, the 25 richest uh, people in the country pay hardly any taxes at all. How is that going to resonate? I mean, this is fodder for, for what you both are doing here. I mean, can you make it any clearer to the guy out there who's trying to survive and he's paying percentage-wise a lot more in taxes? I mean, this is, again, it, it, it's clear as day. Right? Uh, is Nick being polite to let me uh, ch try to jump in on one? Yeah, it sounded like is. a Nick question. Go for uh, it. It's your question too. It's... Um, but yeah, I, I think it, it absolutely, uh, it, it highlights the kind of struggle that we're in, that we are, we are organized people going against organized money. And I mean, that goes back all the way to Aristotle. I'm trying to earn my credit with you since you're an academic. You know, the uh, the struggle of the many with not enough against the few who have more than enough. It's it's the eternal character of politics. But we do have two parties that serve the top of the triangle right now. And uh, I agree with Nick that it's, it's morally incumbent on us, not just here in America, but uh, globally, that we create political options for the bottom of that triangle, for the working people who don't have enough. Yeah. yeah. Um, in, in the remaining few minutes that we have, how can we contact both of you? People out there uh, are going to want to get involved. Our audience um, would like to participate. How do they get in touch with you? How do they find that find find out more about you? So you've got a podcast going. Uh, tell us a little more on how our audience can get in touch with you. And we need everybody. We need everybody to participate in this. It can be done, but we have to get engaged because we don't have any more election cycles to waste, to burn. This 
process between the two parties of shifting us further and further towards oligarchy, towards authoritarianism. We have, as Richard Wolff has said so eloquently, a level of inequality now that is unmatched going back to ancient Egypt. And this is in modern times with a level of technology that could provide for everyone. And so we need everybody to go to peoplesparty.org, sign up, join us, volunteer, make a contribution if you can, get involved in your state parties. That's where we want people building. That's where people, those, those are gonna be our laboratories of democracy. And so we need everybody coming in and getting involved with us in one way or another, because we have three years before we get a, another, before we get a, 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 a true ideological fascist. So the counter reaction to Biden is going to make the counter reaction to Obama look tame. Yeah, yeah. And what about the podcast? Where can they, they can also hear you on that? Everywhere, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Twitch. Um, we are streaming to all those platforms, multi-streaming. We have guests about every couple of weeks. And so you can come and find us, you can listen. Um, uh, and, and we've had some amazing guests and we have uh, some amazing more coming up. You have, you have. Um, and and uh, Mike, give us your last thoughts here, uh, or not, not your last thoughts, but the, the thoughts that we, uh, we only have about a minute to go. So give me your final thoughts on, on, on your role in this in particular. Um, well, I, it's a privilege to be able to serve the community and this cause in, in this particular role. Leading the Democrat Progressive Caucus here in Colorado during this last election, I, I saw some of the best people I've ever known in my life shaking their head, saying that they've got to go along with Biden because they have no choice. And I was determined that I'm going to roll the dice and risk everything, leave the party and try to provide that choice to the best I can. So if you all want to see me get involved with your state party, and I'm visiting with all the state parties to help them get started. And together we're working at building a, it's not just a new party, it's a new kind of party, uh, born of this age and, and looking to the future like none of the other parties are. That's a great way of putting it. It's a, it's a, it's a party for a new world, a transformative world, and you really put it so well. Nick, Mike, thank you so very, very much. This has really been very helpful. It's been, it, it's been just terrific to see you both uh, and, and meet you, Mike, for the first time. And, and Nick will talk again, I know, and Mike as well. We at the Radical Imagination are, all, are behind you. We support what you're doing, and uh, you always have a forum here. And, I, again, thank you so very, very much thank for your effort you. and, and your success because we're going to need it are that's 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 all she wrote this is it we we have one basic final chance to get this right and um you guys are getting it right okay so thank you again very very much thank you jim always thank you all right thank, thank you. you for having us thank you and thank you all so very very much for watching us on the radical imagination today this is jim Vretos. have a great week and we'll see you again next week on the Radical Imagination.